We're back talking Formula One for ProLine. This is our uh, ProLine TV. Uh, we're going to be officially uh, marketing this channel uh, real shortly. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we are filling it up with a library of new shows. So I know the season's almost over here for us covering F1 over on Prime Sports Network and our older Mystery Caution YouTube channel. But we do have a new YouTube channel that's going to really help us out with traffic. And uh, we're going to kind of integrate uh, with every sport. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And this is a way for us to get a kickstart on that. And of course, we're going to be back here for the next several weeks to, fo to follow through for the end of the F1 season. And then we're going to return next season and also talk about what's going on in the offseason at some point. Uh, NASCAR fans, don't forget, we're going to be back also in a few weeks when the F1 season is over. And we're going to have our official offseason video right here on this pro channel. So joining me, of course, every week, CJ Redoon, rotowire.com. And CJ, the final off time is over. <laughs> it's uh, three weeks, three races but it's kind of all academic, at least for the drivers it is. For the drivers, it's basically been done, and we've been telling you that for quite a while. I took a peek at the futures this morning just to see if they were even still collecting bets on Max Verstappen at this point, and oddly enough, they are. Uh, so <laughs> we, you had to have followed our, our advice several, uh, several months ago at this point, though, because it's basically all wrapped up um, and very well. Uh, could be completely wrapped up, mathematically speaking, uh, this weekend in Las Vegas if Max Verstappen is able to stay within three points of Lando Norris through the weekend. As long as Lando doesn't outscore him by more than three points, titles go into Verstappen. Yeah, that is a pretty big future nut that you'd have to give up. But, I mean, look, uh, if you have it, do it because <laughs> you're not going to lose uh, still. A $20 oh, bet pays off 40 cents. Um, yeah. You're wondering. Uh, but, it, <laughs> but it will pay off. It will so pay off. You just got to have the money. So yeah. do you have enough money to make it count? That's the trick. Uh, but like you said, you warned everybody. And that's all you can do. And if you're new to the channel, well, uh, all we can do is, is uh, have you reference back to some of our older videos when uh, we uh, recommended the Max for Staff and Play uh, several weeks ago when things were not looking so good for Max, according to the odds, but we knew better. All right, so let's take a look at the the race uh, notes here as far as the odds, of course. We'll start off there. And Max is back to being the favorite. Is this just because of the way things have turned for Max in the last yeah. uh, couple of weeks, <laughs> or does this have to do with the venue? This is totally because of his domination in Brazil. I you know, Red Bull has been saying they've gotten on top of their problems, that they've figured out how to make the car more competitive to where M McLaren and uh, Ferrari have been. We have yet to actually see that really play out, though. So uh, the last time out at Brazil, it was dominant performance from Max in the race on Sunday. It was extremely wet in varying conditions. Lots of uh, had red flags, it had caution flags, et cetera, et cetera. So Max Verstappen was able to come from behind due to his engine penalties. I think he started 17th on the grid, was able to come from behind and win. He ended up leading 27 of the 69 laps. But flip that all around. When you come to Las Vegas, it's a high high speed, long straights, very slow corner track. It's in this a city track, which we know is a place that Red Bull does not perform well at. They have not done well at, call it Azerbaijan. They have, you know, uh, Singapore was a little bit of a surprise where Verstappen did his best and came in second. Um, but I still don't think uh, the performances that we've seen at any track like this so far this year would suggest that Max Verstappen should be, or at least the second half of the year, that Max Verstappen should be the favorite this weekend at Las Vegas. All right. And uh, as far as the rest of the top contenders, Lando Norris and Leclerc right behind, um, What's the way to go with these top three right now? The so Las Vegas, it's interesting. We have a, you know, the benefit of having a Grand Prix in our home country is that we get to watch the race at 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why, but this is unique to Las Vegas. And it gets cold in Las Vegas overnight. Uh, and that's exactly when they're going to be racing. So given the... <laughs> 
<laughs> given the long straights, very slow corners, there's not a whole chance, whole lot of chance to get heat into the tires. So that's another reason why I think the Red Bull is not going to do so well. However, the team that does a really good job and has over the past two seasons done a really good job of getting temperature into their tires and getting them uh, warmed up really quickly is Ferrari. So I think Lando Norris and Charles Leclerc are probably good. Uh, next best guesses uh, probably should be the favorites over Verstappen, to be quite honest with you. But honestly, I'd kind of give the edge this weekend specifically to Ferrari and Charles Leclerc. Leclerc last year, looking at this race, um, had a very good, very good car. Uh, he led 13 laps out of the 50. Max Verstappen ended up winning that. But if you actually look at what happened, uh, Leclerc was about ready to win. And then uh, we had a safety car come out and then Max Verstappen was able to overtake him. So it, uh, it looks like a Ferrari track. Uh, Ferrari performed well at the, the tracks with long straights and slow corners throughout this season. Uh, so I do think I give the edge this weekend to Ferrari, specifically Charles Leclerc though I wouldn't put Lando Norris and McLaren too far behind in second in terms of my top picks. So this is more than likely you're looking at a race where it's kind of academic, no real chance to make money. And again, anytime you have three players, three drivers that are tightly uh, packed it here, uh, it's kind of hard uh, because there's only one that wins. Um, so you could better get it right. Uh, do you feel that even though the odds are pretty tight here, that you're pretty confident about your pick or uh, is there another way to try to make some money this week? I think the other way to try to make some money is looking at your Ferrari teammate and perhaps even your McLaren teammate and Carlos Sainz and Oscar Piastri. If you look at the odds for Sainz in the exact same car as Leclerc in that Ferrari, but you're getting more than twice the value for your money. Um, you know, looking at signs from a podium position, even that 250 there in the second column, that's actually very attractive. Uh, Oscar Piastri for a podium as well um, could, is very well a, a possibility. You know, could be a McLaren 1-2. Uh, if Norris ha ends up having any problems, Piastri is going to be carrying the banner for McLaren. But uh, giving the edge to Ferrari, I think the best value on the board for this weekend for Las Vegas is probably Carlos Sainz. So if he's able to qualify, say in the top three, maybe even call it the top four, uh, odds might change a little bit, but Carlos Sainz might be still the best value on the board come Saturday afternoon after qualifying. Uh, is it is it going to be one of those deals where, because Max is so far ahead, the only thing you could do is do something stupid that is going to limit his chances of victory that he's just going to play it cool or is so far out in front that he doesn't have to worry about any of that. He just goes for the win and whatever happens, happens. To put the championship perspective in or put to put the championship into perspective, um, Max Verstappen, there, there are 80, what, 88 points, I think, uh, that are available until the end of the season. And that would take winning every single race, all last, all three of them, it would mean winning the sprint race in Qatar, and it would mean getting the fastest lap in all three of those races as well. The That's only good. way that Max Verstappen, That's even, all. If he, even if he throws it into a wall uh, this weekend, um, I still think um, th there's no way Max Verstappen loses this. So, so I don't think there's any pressure on him. I don't think that he's he needs to play it overly conservative. He could crash out of every single race. Still the odds of Lando Norris sweeping the wins and fastest laps through every single on-track event through the remainder of the season these next <laughs> three weeks is just not likely. So even if he won every single one, he's not going to get the fastest lap in every one. Uh, so I think that's your three points right there. Uh, Max Verstappen coming out of this weekend, that's what he needs in order to mathematically tie up the championship. So as long as he... Uh, stays within three points this Sunday at Las Vegas. The the championships going to Verstappen. It's just a question of when when it becomes mathematically impossible. If it doesn't happen this weekend, it's highly likely to happen next week at Qatar. Okay, let's um, take a look at the manufacturers and tell you what. It's also pop up. We haven't looked at the newsletter Prime Tire in a little bit. 
Uh, and again, we'll have the link in the description of how you can uh, check these out. These are free. Um, I believe this is from The Athletic. And pop this up because they have here, – here are the points for the constructor standings. And they have uh, three-ish scenarios of ways the constructor's championship might turn out. Scenario number one. McLaren seals it early. Scenario number two, McLaren falters. Two-way Ferrari maximized points. You can go ahead and read all this. There's scenario two, no stopping Red Bull. Chaos reigns in Abu Dhabi. So as far as all of these, just getting into like one of them, say here, that McLaren seals, seals it early. So you can read there. Uh, they have the upper hand. Margin uh, for error slim. Solid strategy focused on minimizing risk. And maintaining consistent scoring between both drivers should be enough to secure the championship. Luckily, McLaren's car has been one of the most track versatile on the grid this season. Scoring a couple of podiums across the final three race weekends should lock it up. Uh, do you think that is scenario number one most likely that is going to take place? I do. McLaren is, um, you know, what, 34-ish points, I think, ahead of Ferrari. Uh, Ferrari while they might be the favorite this weekend at Las Vegas, I think next week when we go to Qatar, that's very much a McLaren track and it's got the McLaren name stamped all over it. So just preview Lando Norris is probably going to be your top choice next week at Qatar. Um, but despite the fact that Ferrari probably has the edge here in Las Vegas, McLaren has the lead in the constructors standings. And I agree with the, the writing there that they're probably going to take it relatively conservative they still have to race and they still have to finish on podiums and maximize the points that they can get but as long as they do that they've got a healthy enough lead over ferrari that as long as they don't throw it into the into the wall both cars uh, and have some major issue i think that it's going to be theirs the real question is what mistakes does mclaren make over the next three weeks even at in brazil um norris had two mistakes norris had a starting restart infraction because he didn't follow the uh, orders that could did not end up in an on-track penalty in the race it ended up with a fine uh afterward but that another brain lapse like that could cost them and then they've been known throughout this year to make bad pit calls they've just made bad strategy calls they've pitted their drivers at the worst possible time and they've done it a handful of times probably three to five times that i can count through the rest of the season so if they can minimize those mistakes that they've been prone to so far, again, I think it's theirs. Hopefully they've learned their lessons at this point. Uh, if those things start piling up and they start second guessing themselves, I think that's the real scenario where Ferrari can truly catch catch them. Now, I'm not saying that Ferrari is not going to make a race out of it because Ferrari is going to chase them all the way. But I think as long as McLaren stays cool and, and keeps doing what they're doing, this constructor's title is going to McLaren. All right. And what about this scenario? This is going to be almost as wild as Lando Norris. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure that's happening. <laughs> um, so who would you who would you bet on most? Who, who has a better chance? <clears throat> Red Bull, right? They would have the better chance, you think, to win the constructor than Lando Norris has to win to win the drivers? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think if you're if you want to go for a long shot and a come from behind Victor for one of these two championships, Norris is not the guy to go with. It would be Red Bull turning it around. So I, I started off at the beginning saying that Red Bull has said multiple times that they feel like they've gotten on top of their car issues that made them slow down in the second half of the season. However, we haven't seen that in a dry race in a normal type of track yet. Yes, we've seen incremental gains. Uh, they finished second in Singapore. I think that's the one thing that we could point to to really be uh, evidence of the fact that they're not lying about that. But the question is, how much have they closed the gap to Mercedes or, or McLaren Mercedes? Um, and I just don't. I don't know that they've closed the gap so much over the past couple of weeks that in the last three weeks that both Red Bulls are going to be in the points and, and winning these last three races. I still think the favorites are going to be Ferrari and McLaren come the next three weeks, which puts Red Bull in the, the third place position for the constructors title. However, if you want that long shot come from behind uh, choice, then then Red Bull to win the constructors title would be the recommendation. And you're not getting bad odds there either 
Okay, yeah, based on these odds, it's looking like, well, let's see here. Wait a second. All right, so according to these odds, they believe Lando Norris has a much likelier shot at winning the driver's championship than Red Bull does is winning the constructor's championship. Yes. And the reason why is that the constructor's championship takes into account both drivers. Remember who Max's yes. teammate is Sergio Perez. Perez has just been awful. This yeah. year. He's failed to score points. If Red Bull come from behind to win it, they need, they need Perez to step up and actually be finishing on the podium, which he has not done this season. Are these odds good, normal, or, you know, would you say that this is a really good, again, if you're one of those people that you have money and you're willing to put down, this would be a really good wager on McLaren, even though it's 750 or you, you, you're, you're just, you're not really positive about that. Not at 750, not at that price. Not at 750. I'd want it to be a little bit closer. I'd be okay with negative. Um, we start getting into the 350, 400 range. I would absolutely tell you to, you know, do everything you can. Uh, that's that. That would be a great, great number there. But once you start hitting 750, you're about saying that it's theirs. There's still a pretty decent chance that Ferrari could. I mean, I think Ferrari is going to do really well this weekend. Uh, remains to be seen how far behind they're going to be in Qatar. I expect them to be behind, but. If they're still second or third, then they're going to be right in the mix for Abu Dhabi and negative 750 when we get to Abu Dhabi is, uh, I don't know, this far out from Abu Dhabi, it's negative 750 is not the way I want to go. Okay. Next up is going to be uh, Qatar, correct? Qatar will be next. That'll be another desert track, but it's got uh, some faster corners, some medium speed and high speed corners. Uh, that Ferrari is a little bit more concerned about, whereas I think that type of track is really well suited to the McLaren, which even the the Atlantic article or that you, you read earlier said they've got a very versatile car, and I think that uh, Qatar track really plays to their strengths, as long as they don't shoot themselves in the foot again. So uh, before we move on, uh What's a Cola Pinto fever? Uh, Cola Pinto came. Cola Pinto. <laughs> new driver, uh, new driver coming into the coming into the series. So I, again, like somebody who who's you know got a lot of success as, as a junior driver coming up, uh, stepped in with McLaren. Um, I'm sorry, with Williams, ended up uh, crashing out at Brazil. Uh, he's from Argentina, so uh, just a new driver, a uh, very exciting future ahead of him and the possibility that he may and will eventually go on from Williams to do bigger things. So, and this kid's 21? Mm -hmm. As far as I know, allegedly. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and so what, they're talking about, so where is he right now? What's his uh, path? Right now he's Williams. Um, so, Williams. so what is that? A um, is there a partnership there with it with some of the big boys, or is that no? That's just they're, they're, they've got them. Uh, that's a good question. So Williams is actually uh, they've got um, a Mercedes engine, so they've got ties through probably McLaren, probably through Mercedes, anybody else that is running a Mercedes engine, one of the other teams I want to say is switching to Mercedes in 2025. So Colapinto, like I said, coming in um, as a new driver to the series, um, successful in all the junior formula, being able to, to come up here and getting his first rides uh, in Formula One um, with a manufacturer or an engine provider like Mercedes that's got its fingers throughout the grid. I think there's a lot of opportunity for him to go elsewhere, whether it's, you know, up to Mercedes potentially to, to replace Lewis Hamilton. It could eventually be uh, going to McLaren when either Piastri or, or Norris go away. Uh, but as long as he plays, it, it takes a lot of luck to be able to make it through all of those uh, steps and make the right decisions along the way. Um, as we've seen a lot of drivers with a lot of potential just kind of flame out 
uh, despite getting the opportunity. So he's he's got to he's got to make the right decisions. He's got to have luck. He's got to get some results. But I think the future is bright for him, uh, depending on where he wants to go within the Mercedes camp in the future. Uh, before again, we're going to talk about Qatar next week. Uh, this is just from one of their uh, prime tires, uh, one of their news blasts, email blasts, where they talk about the scenarios, the championship scenarios, and they talk about um, the Verstappen Qatar yawn redo. Um, so, what, what do you, what, what's the situation going to be there? Because they mentioned how last season. He had a big lead, and that led to one of the most anticlimactic title-clinching moments in years, uh, winning the title in the sprint race uh, at one of the least hyped races on the calendar. Could that happen again? I, I don't see why not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, this is the difference. This is the big deal between what we talk a lot about over on NASCAR – you know, with the with the with the the stages and the I mean, you know, the group the group stages and the playoffs and and should it be about the whole season and 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 this is what look that's why I as much as we criticize NASCAR we do applaud them at times and one of the things that I know that you're 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 somebody who would who would prefer the old system over the new, um, but you do see the advantages to the new, and that is the fact that you don't have this kind of stuff happening and that's what they just don't want happening. And it's, I mean, look, the differences are, are very simple. NASCAR is in the United States. It's a completely different fan base than the fan base that takes over predominantly at F1. That's a fan base that, that if they like F1, the chances are they like soccer too, football. And, <laughs> you know, there's the same kind of, uh, you know, criticisms that uh, sports fans here in the United States have with the game, the sport of football, uh, soccer. So, um, you know, we, we, we like, we, we like excitement. We like wins. We like dramatic wins. We don't want somebody winning a championship in some secondary race on the weekend. So, but that's just the way it is. That is exactly correct. So, um, yeah. Uh, Again, I'm not a fan of the sprint format. I think I've said that several times as well. I like the focus on the true championship race on Sundays. And Formula One for several years, many years, has been very processional. It has been very predictable. You'd be able to predict within one or two places probably the top 10 finishers almost every single week. Um, that all changed this season once McLaren stepped up and Red Bull kind of lost their path, which again, I think is why uh, you're seeing some of that Colapinto fever. We get some new blood into the series. It's not, you know, he's going to have to have the right car in order to really shine. But even if you get into the right car, you might still be behind the next rules change and um, you know, Red Bull goes right back up to the top uh, with Colapinto though. And we just talked about Perez, some of the speculation around him also, despite being a Mercedes driver at Williams is that uh, he could potentially come in to take Perez's seat if Perez continues to fail. So again, it's a lot of speculation, but it forces that conversation and the focus to the back of the pack and <clears throat> And that's where the story is developed, like who's who's coming next. And you and I, we talk about, I don't know, you know, Ryan Priest. OK, he might be a good example. So generally in NASCAR each week this past season, the past two seasons, we haven't really talked about him. And he's magically getting a third car at RFK Racing next year for 2025. So uh, the focus here is significantly less on that, whereas you're getting headlines on Colapinto in, in Formula One. So that does speak volumes as to the difference in the fan bases, what they're interested, but then also where the drama truly is on track, which is at Formula One until very recently, it has not been at the front of the field. Is this a big deal here, having a new race director at F1? It could be. That was probably the biggest piece of news that came out. Um, so I, I think Formula One has had two race directors since um, uh, the great Charlie Whiting passed away. Uh, the first one was Michael Massey. Uh, Michael Massey, if you remember the very first championship that Max Verstappen won with Red Bull, there was a heck of a lot of controversy in the Abu Dhabi race through race control that gave Max Verstappen the opportunity to win that championship. Massey was subsequently... Uh, 
you know, let go, I guess, or he left in favor of this new race director that came in. And there really hasn't been, you know, a whole lot of news as to why. Um, you, if you read into what the, the press release said, uh, you would think that he was fired. But the press release didn't say that he was fired. It said that he just left and decided to leave. It's weird that Formula One would do that with just three races left to go. Um, so there's definitely something going on there, but nothing that they've shown or said would lead us to believe that, um, or at least lead, give us any good rumors as to why. Um, it could be a big deal over the next three races because you're going to have somebody who hasn't called a Formula One race in that seat in the last three races of the season with the championship still undecided. So we could see some botched decisions, hopefully not. Hopefully everything just plays out on track and the race director doesn't have to get involved. Uh, but if he does, then that's a potential where you look at inconsistent penalties or you know, um, more uh, draconian p penalties, et cetera. So we'll see how that plays out in the next three weeks. Is that a political job? Is that the problem? Uh, or is it's it more of how you interpret the rules? It's partly political for sure, because you've got you, you have to work with all of the teams and, and each of the teams have aligned to the race director throughout the race to be able to ask questions and raise issues, so on and so forth. But it's the race director's job to ensure that the rule book is followed and it's up to you know their interpretation in the heat of the moment. There are a lot of very fast decisions that need to be made in certain circumstances in these races. Uh, you hope that you make them consistently. You hope that you make them, they, that they are made fairly and consistently throughout. And I think that's going to be the true challenge of any good race director, this one, especially over the next three weeks. Probably is more it, importantly this week, since the championship could likely be won this week. Is it similar to the decisions that NASCAR has to make uh, or yeah. would it be different? Same, yes. Similar. Similar. You have the you have the driver, you have the stewards on the race weekend, which actually review any kind of incidents um, that need to um, be reviewed and assessed for a penalty and so on and so forth. But the race director is ultimately in charge of how it all plays out. So uh, their involvement, hopefully they are you know behind the scenes and, and nobody know, nobody's any wiser. Um, we've seen some crazy decisions made by race directors in the past, a la Michael Massey and in the Abu Dhabi race that I mentioned before, where Verstappen ended up taking the championship. I just hope that that doesn't play out. The best case scenario, given a new race director, uh, is just that they don't have to make any calls. That's, uh, I think we all know how that feels in any sport uh, regarding the officials. So just leave them out of it. It's the best way. All right, so next week, Qatar, and then it's off to Abu Dhabi, and that'll wrap it up for the F1 season in 2024. Uh, you can uh, check out uh, CJ's uh, fantasy report uh, for the race. Uh, that'll be available on Friday. Uh, so we'll post that uh, here along with the video. Uh, and, uh, and then the race is, again, since it's uh, here in the U.S., like you said, though, it's at night. So that means it's was overnight on Saturday night uh, yes. Eastern, or how does that? It's... Uh it's late at night, even in Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, it's like midnight, 11 o'clock midnight, I want to say. So three in the morning Eastern time. It's It'll be going on at three o'clock in the morning Eastern time. I'm not sure exactly when the race starts on Sunday, but I do know first practice kicks off um, Thursday night Eastern time at 9.30 p.m. Uh, 6.30 Las Vegas time. Uh, and then second practice, I want to say, is somewhere closer to 11 on Thursday after Thursday night. I almost said yeah. afternoon. That's crazy. We talked about it last year, and yeah. I guess they didn't care. They're just going to keep doing it. So, um, but then again, I guess it, it, it's just about what is it, is it? Is it really about appeasing the bigger audience? It's about appeasing the bit, a bigger audience. I also saw another benefit, and I don't know how true it is, of being able to keep the drivers and teams on the schedule on the same time zone schedule okay. when they go to. It is three straight weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so for three straight weeks and they're going immediately from here to Qatar, it's probably helpful if they're able to stay on that same schedule. I don't know how much that's possible, though, given all the press commitments and, and sponsor commitments that they have throughout a weekend. So sure. uh, we'll see. Uh, yet again, uh, I'm not happy with it. Uh, I, would, I would like to be able to see it at a normal hour. Instead, I will be taping it and watching it when I wake up. 
That's the best way to watch it anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but there aren't that many commercials, or at least it doesn't seem like there there's very no many commercials. commercials. There yeah, are no, none. Yeah, so. that is one thing I do commend uh, ESPN for going with Sky. So ESPN is the broadcaster in the United States, for those of you who don't know, uh, but they just basically buy Sky's, Sky Sports, which is UK-based, their, their broadcast. So they just basically feed the, the okay. Sky broadcast through and and during the race there are no 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 commercials they show it flag to flag no stops no breaks uh which is excellent uh, i commend yeah. them commend espn for actually doing that when they first got it they tried to smooshing commercials and it really sucked because you'd come back mid-sentence or they'd leave mid-sentence yes. uh, but they've at least learned to avoid that now so that is a good thing all right no such luck of course in nascar because no. we're here in the u.s and that doesn't fly unfortunately Absolutely. No. All right. So that's going to wrap it up. We'll see you guys again uh, next week. Don't forget to check out the links in the description for everything, including uh, CJ's take on the race at rotowire.com. And we'll see you next week.